Well, we live in an interesting time, don't we? Um, it is an interesting, uh, interesting time to be alive for sure. Um, I, I say that because we live in the United States of America. I don't think there's anybody. Does anybody here live outside of the United States? I didn't think so. I didn't know if maybe we had a visitor from another country, but uh, it doesn't look like it. So um, y'all live in the United States. That's the hard-hitting truth for the day. Um, but even though it's the United States, there does, right now in our current political climate, there seems to be an awful lot of disunity, doesn't there? There seems to be an awful lot of division within the United States. And in case you, in case you don't agree with that, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some proof that there's a lot of disunity right now. Um, a quick show of hands. Did anybody watch the presidential debate a couple weeks ago? I did. Did anybody watch the VP debate this week? I did. At least most of it. I put kids to bed, so I missed parts of it. But watch most of it. Well, if you watch that, then you know that there is an awful lot of division. There is an awful lot of division. Um, I, actually, uh, I actually stayed and watched, uh, watched the, the after show where they gave their analysis of the, of the debates because I think that might be the most fascinating part of the whole thing. Like, I think most people know pretty much who, if you're a voter, who you're going to be voting for. I think most people pretty much know before they watch the debate who they're going to be voting for. And it shows if you watch the, the analysis of the debates afterwards. Um, I was watching, watching one after the vice presidential debate, and I'm not going to say who said who about what because I'm not taking political sides this morning. Um, instead, I just want to point out one of the commentators said that a candidate um, did a masterful job. That was, that was the word he used. He did a masterful job. Then the other commentator said he looked like a fool. And I'm like, were you guys watching the same debate here? Was it masterful or was he a fool? Which one is it? Like, I think people take out of it what they want to take out of it. And I, I, again, again, my point isn't to take a political side. It's just to point out, like, how disunified we really are. How much of a lack of unity there is. There was even a lack of unity in their opinion about the debate. Like, was it good or was it not? There was so much disunity. But see, the reality is that that should not be the case in the church. There should not be just ridiculous amounts of disunity within the church. But for some reason, but for some reason, even within the church, oftentimes there is gossip, there are feuds, there are little factions and cliques within the church. I don't know if any of you have ever been a part of that, uh, part of a church that has that, or, or if you've ever experienced anything like that, but I have. I have. I've experienced that before. But the Bible says that we, as the church, we should be fundamentally different from the rest of the world. That's what we talked about last week as, as Peter calls people to live lives of holiness, right? They were to be set apart. They were to be different. And the church should be different. And one of the key distinctions between the church and the rest of the world should be a just completely different, unexplainable sense of unity. We should have that within the church. And I think the first church, the first century church, they had that. I mean, you read through the book of Acts and you see it. And I just want to share this with you. Acts chapter 2, verse 44. It says, Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the, the proceeds to all as any had need. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. The church in the first century was marked by a radical sense of unity. It was something that was different from the, what the world was showing. It was just fundamentally different. And it's something that can only happen, it can only happen with the supernatural working of God in the church. As the Spirit comes and binds us together, that's the only way that kind of unity can happen. So if we, if we have been born again into the living hope that we talked about from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, if we have been born into that, it will play out in our lives. And one of the ways that will play out in our lives is unity within the church. There should be unity within the church, okay? Um, Warren Wearsby wrote a commentary on this, and, and he said, if we try to build unity in the church on the basis of our first birth, we will fail. But a lot of times that's what happens within the church, isn't it? 
We try to build some superficial sense of unity around things that we've gained from here and now, like, like from our fathers, from our biological fathers, um, from our families, from our friends, from our culture. We try to build unity around all of these things, and every single one of them will fail. The only way we can have a sense of unity, a true unity within the church, is if we, if we have that unity around Jesus. Because we're not building unity around in the church anyway. We're not building unity around our first birth. We're building unity as it comes as a result of the new birth we have in the living hope, and that comes from Jesus. So today, today in our text, we are going to see three pictures of that unity that we have within the church. Okay? So let's stand together. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 22 this morning. It says... Since you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth, so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other, from a pure heart love one another constantly, because you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever." And this word is the gospel that was proclaimed to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, desire the pure milk of the word so that you may grow up into your salvation if you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by people but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves, as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built into are being built to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So honor will come to you who believe. But for the unbelieving, the stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone, and the stone, or, and a stone to stumble over, and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they disobey the word. They were destined for this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Thank God for his word. And you may be seated. Three depictions here in this text. Three depictions of the bond within the church. Three depictions of the bond within the church. First, as God's chosen exiles, we are born into a new family. As God's chosen exiles, we are born into a new family. Okay, remember last week, remember back to last week, we talked about living lives of holiness because of the grace that we have received from God in Jesus. Right? We don't live lives of holiness. We don't live lives that are fundamentally different on our own basis, on, on our own merit. We do that based off the grace that's been given to us through Jesus. All right? And this week, Peter starts explaining the practicality of that truth. Like, you, you are different, you are set apart, you are, you are holy. And he says, well, here's how that plays out in your life. Here's how practical that is. He says, since you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other from a pure heart, love one another constantly. So since you've been purified, we have come to Jesus and we have been given a new birth into this living hope. And so, so he says, this instruction is for you believers, those who follow Jesus he says, if you are trying to find that unity around anything but Christ, it will fail, like we just talked about a minute ago. Because remember, last week we talked about how you were redeemed. First Peter says, you were redeemed from your empty way of life that you inherited from your fathers. But a lot of times churches will try to find their primary source of unity around all sorts of things other than the gospel. They will. I mean, I've been a part of churches like that. I remember, and I'm, I want to be careful because I don't want to bash another church, um, but I remember when Steph and I, we lived, in, we lived in Texas, we were looking for a church to go to, and one of the things that I really wanted to be a part of was a, was a good small group. Um, just so you all know, I'm going to plug our, our Sunday school real, classes real quick. If you're not a part of a small group, get plugged in someplace. Um, it's, 
one thing. It's one thing to grow as a part of the larger body, and I want you all to be here. It's good to be together with the body. But if you're not together with other, another group of believers, whether that be on a Sunday morning or it be a midweek study, it's really hard to have that kind of accountability and that kind of real deep growing bond um, and, and build those clo- close relationships. So that's one of the things that we wanted whenever we lived in Texas. And um, we went to a couple different churches, and the first one we went to, we loved the church. It was great. We'd go together, and um, our kids enjoyed going, and they had a whole kids ministry section, and it was awesome. And then we would go in to the worship service, and they had a, had a live band, and it was it was awesome. The worship experience, like the music experience, was great. It was fantastic. And every week, every week, we would go, and we were built up, and we were excited to worship, and it was always good. And then the pastor would get up, and he would preach, and he was far better than me, and he would preach a sermon, and it always had a point that just stuck, and it hit home, and he did a great job of preaching. But we wanted to be a part of a good small group. So we started going to these small groups, and the way that they split us up was based off of your age. They would base you, it would, they would split you up based off of how your kids' ages. They would split you up based off of um, your interests like your hobbies, then they would split you up into these little sections based off of things that you liked and you preferred, which, again, isn't all bad. I know some people are going to naturally gravitate to others because they have common interests. I know that. I'm not, I'm not blind to that truth. But the reality is, a lot of times what we'll do is, just like that church, we'll try to build our relationships, we'll try to build unity within those groups based off of something that we inherited from this world. Like, we were put in a group that enjoyed watching sporting events. Um, I I love baseball, so we marked that down. And, and, you know, it was one of the things that we we were enjoying at that time. So we were put in a group with other people who loved sports. So we get together and we talk about baseball, which is fine. It's not bad. Just so you know, baseball's good. Everybody loves baseball. Um, That's not biblical. That's Jared. Um, So... Anyway, we we were put in that group. But the reality is we were trying to build a unity around something other than Jesus. We weren't, I I mean, it just wasn't around like the gospel foundation. We weren't, we were together first because I guess we all knew Jesus and we wanted to grow in that relationship. But then it became about this other thing that we inherited from someplace else. So if we're trying to build that unity around something other than Christ, it will fail. It wasn't the main point. Like, we got away from Jesus unintentionally. So, our unity needs to be built around Christ. And all of this assumes that we have done what we talked about last week. That we've prepared our minds for action. That we are pursuing holiness. And that we're striving to reflect. That's a hard word to say. Striving to reflect Christ in our lives. But then he says that you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth. This obedience to the truth, it doesn't happen like by accident. A lot of times we expect people, you know, they come to Jesus and then it's like, well, okay, now go and be obedient and figure it out. But that's not what Jesus says to do, is it? That's the church's job. That's our job. As we are united, we are to be teaching others also to obey God's word. Right? The Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. Right? We're supposed to teach people what it means to follow Jesus, how to obey Jesus. And you do all of this, all of this, so that that you show sincere brotherly love for each other. Y'all experience brotherly love within the church? You should. It should be there. Because then he gets to the main point of this. He says, you've been redeemed. You've been called to live lives of holiness so that from a pure heart, love one another constantly, he says. Love one another constantly. And this this word here where he says love one another, it's different from that brotherly love that he talked about just, just a few words earlier. Before, it was the word Philadelphia in, in the Greek. And now he says this, this is the command form of the word agape. It's, it's a different kind of love that's never used between a husband and a wife for a romantic relationship. Like that's, It's never used that way in Scripture. It's always either God's love for man or a love that a person has for another person that's inspired by God's love for them. It's always based off of God's unconditional, undying love. And that's the way that we are commanded to love one another constantly. 
And that's the point. Love one another, not because you're, you're naturally compelled to love one another, because if you're waiting to be naturally compelled to love somebody, it's probably not going to happen. Love one another because God loves others. And because God loved you. And out of an outpouring of God's love for you, you are commanded then to go and to love others. Our love for one another in the church isn't because of our common interests. It's because we have a common Savior. Our love for the lost isn't because we share biology with them but because God loves the lost and wants them to to be saved and to repent and to submit to Him. That's where our unity comes. It comes around a love that comes from God, not from anything else. And as a part of this new family, he then goes on and he says, to desire the pure milk of the Word. Desire the pure milk of the Word. And this this word desire, it means to strain after or to long after. So we should be straining for God's word. And he says it's the same way the newborn infant strains or longs for milk. That's the way we should desire God's word. And we need it so that we can grow, so that we can become mature believers. We need more of the word in order to continue to grow. But I thought the way this word desire was used, I thought it was interesting. Um, It doesn't say that oh, you will desire the pure milk of the word. And it doesn't say, like, okay, well, now you desire the pure milk of the word. It doesn't say that. That's not what it says. It's a command. It's in the imperative form. It says, you go desire the word. It is a command to go and do it. And I think we get to an interesting discussion here. Um, I think it's an interesting point right here, okay? Because what we do a lot of times is we will set up another false dichotomy, okay? Remember last week we talked about we have um, God's God's grace on one side, God's holiness on the other side, and really those things are not separated like Jesus as, as Savior and Jesus as Lord. Those aren't two different things. That is one Jesus. He is both of those things. And this week we get another one of these things where a lot of times what we want to do is we want to set up God's sovereignty on one side. Like, yes, God is sovereign over all things. God is powerful. He's in control of everything. God is sovereign over all things. And then on the other side, we want to say, well, there's human responsibility over here. So you have to take care of what you're responsible for. And we set this up to where it's like, okay, we've got these two opposing forces. Is it, which is it? Is it that God is sovereign or is it that I'm responsible? And the answer is yes. Ha, there you go. The answer is yes. And we're going to talk about that more in just a minute. So we're going to come back. But I absolutely believe that when you come to Jesus, he gives you a new heart like Ezekiel says. You know, he removes your heart of stone. He gives you a heart of flesh. I absolutely believe that's true, and he will change your desires. But you have a responsibility. You are commanded to go desire the word of God. Both of those things are true. But see, the problem is a lot of times in the church, we try to find nourishment. Good. We'll just keep going. I'll yell at you this morning. How about that? Ha! All right. I don't know why I did that, but we're going to keep going. A lot of times we try to find nourishment from all kinds of other things in the church. All kinds of things. And you all know it's true. I know it's true because I'm guilty of this also. Like probably the most common thing that we try to find nourishment from is our emotions. I mean, I don't know how many times I've tried to find this feel good, this, this feel good feeling. Like you just want to, you want the, you want the tinglies. You want the goosebumps. You want that feeling where it's like, okay, now my emotions are saying, yeah, yeah, okay, I feel it, so it must be real. And we get this emotional high. But the reality is that our emotions aren't eternal. Those things, those feelings, they fade, they pass. And we're trying to be satisfied based off of those emotional highs. And that's the point of this quote that he gives us from Isaiah at the end of at the end of chapter at the end of chapter one there. He gives us that quote from Isaiah 40 where he says, The grass withers and a flower falls. Like the point is, these things here and now they are temporary, they will not last. Instead, he, we're commanded to desire the good things, the things that are eternal, like God's word. So instead of desiring, like striving after that emotional high, we should be desiring God's word and his truth. That's what we need to be desiring because it's eternal. 
Or think about uh, the other things that we desire. Our bodies have very natural desires. They have very natural urges. And we say, well, if it feels good, then with, we do something with our body that feels good. That must be true, isn't it? Like, it feels good. It feels right. Isn't that what we're created for? Like, isn't that it? That's a lie. This body, this physical body is temporary. I don't know if you all know this, but someday I will die. Did you all know that? That's a big news flash there. Like someday that's going to happen. This body is temporary. And whenever I say this body is temporary, I know some of y'all are like, praise Jesus, because this body hurts. But God says, don't build your life on anything temporary. Don't build your life on anything temporary, but on what is eternal. Build your life on God's word. Desire the things that are eternal, the things that are always there and always good. And once we've received this new birth and learned to desire the pure milk of the word, we, it changes our desires. Since God's word is eternal, desire it, not the natural things of this world. Because if you are with Jesus, this isn't your home. This is not your home. You're given a new birth into a new family, the church. Um, but I want to give a quick word of caution real quick here before we move on. And I promise this will be pretty quick. Okay. Um, a lot of times what we talk about is we talk... I say we. A lot of times I talk about holiness within the church. Um, I spent a whole week on it last week. So we talk about holiness within the church. And a lot of times we can give this impression like if you aren't perfect all the time, if you make mistakes, if you somehow backslide, then you aren't good enough and you don't belong in the church. Like that's unintentional, but a lot of times we give that perception. Let me make something clear. Every single one of us is growing. Now, that's not a that's not an excuse to remain immature. Like, grow into maturity. Go and grow into maturity. But it is impo- it's an important reality to remember because there are flawed people in the church. And I don't know how many people I have heard say, well, I don't want to be a part of the church because of those hypocrites there. You're right. There are hypocrites here. I know. I'm one of them. There are hypocrites here. But a reason to st- using that as a reason to stay away from the church is just, it's foolish. Because we're not building unity around Jared. We're building unity around Jesus. You're not building unity around any of the people in the church. You're building unity around Jesus, okay? So he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So as God's chosen exiles, we're born into this new family, the church. And as God's chosen exiles, second, we are built into a new temple. We're being built into a new temple. So verse 4 goes on. It says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by people, but chosen and honored by God. So as you come to him, this is the one who gives you the pure milk in this new family. He said, and then look how he's described here. I love the way he's described here. Just pay attention to that as you read it. It's bathed in Old Testament language. He quotes from the Old Testament several times. And there, some of them are even passages that Jesus used in the New Testament. So we get this picture of who he is. Jesus being rejected by the people, the rejected stone. And just so you're clear, this isn't just the first century people that rejected Jesus. This is all people who have rejected Jesus. All of us are sinners. We have all turned from him, every single one of us. But he has chosen, he was chosen and honored by God. That's what I meant last week whenever I said to reflect the chosen one. Jesus was the chosen and honored cornerstone. He was the chosen one. Like, we should be built on him. And because he is living, verse 5 says, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built. So if you are in the living stone, then you become a living stone. Y'all tracking with that? You can be alive because he is alive. And he says that you're being built into something supernatural. And I use that word supernatural today for a very, it's very specific. It's very, not specific, very intentional is the word I'm looking for. Very intentional. He says that you're being built into a spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices. And what God is doing in the church and building the church is bigger than what you or and I can possibly fathom. It is bigger than what you can see. It is a supernatural work that is only possible through God's supernatural power. And his work is to build us into a new temple and a holy priesthood, he says. And I don't want to dwell on the holy priesthood here because we're going to come back to it in a minute. Okay? But it's not the first time this analogy has been used. It's not the first time this analogy has been used. 
Verse 6, he quotes from Isaiah chapter 28, 16. He says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Isaiah used this to show that there would be a cornerstone, and we know that that is Jesus, the beginning of the building. He is the cornerstone, the foundation, the one on which everything else is built. It's Jesus. And faith in Jesus, the honored and chosen cornerstone, relieves all shame. And instead of shame, we receive honor if we believe, if we trust in him. But there's the flip side of the coin. Those who come to Jesus, shame is relieved. They're honored. But, verse 7, for the unbelieving, he is the stone the builders rejected, and one that they will stumble over and trip over. But why? Why is that the case? Why does it play out that way? Well, verse 8 explains it. second half of verse 8 says, They stumble because they disobey the word. They were destined for this. (laughs) They trip and they stumble because they don't obey God's word. They don't obey either the written word or the incarnate word in Jesus. They don't obey, so they trip and they stumble. But it says that they were destined for this. Again, which is it? Which is it? Is it because of their actions? Because of something that they were responsible for? Or is it because they were destined for it? Which one is it? The answer is yes. (laughs) Again, it it kills me because I've been a part of a lot of conversations, and I actually enjoy a lot of these conversations um, because I enjoy enjoy the debate. Maybe that's why I watch the presidential debates. I enjoy the debate. I enjoy those discussions. It's fun for me. Um, My wife, it drives her nuts because I want to debate things. Like, she'll bring something up. I'm like, but have you considered... I agree with her wholeheartedly, just furiating, I know. Um, I'm maddening. Um, but uh, I don't know how many times I've had this conversation where somebody will say, well, do you believe that you are, like, do you believe it was because you're saved because you were predestined, or do you believe that you were saved because of your human free will? And I love this debate. Oh, it's so much fun, because I think it's a massive distraction. I think that's what it is. It is a massive distraction. So let me lay this to rest right now where Jared stands anyway. Um, We have God's sovereignty on one side and human choice on the other. You remember that? Sovereignty, human choice? Both are true. Both are absolutely true. God's word calls us to respond to Jesus. Commands us to, to actually respond to Jesus. Go back all the way back to the Old Testament. You go to Deuteronomy. It says, I set before you life and death, good and evil. Now choose life. Yeah, you've got a responsibility. You have to choose life. But on the other hand, God is absolutely, completely, and totally sovereign. God chooses in some way, shape, or form. God is not surprised that this person came to Jesus and that person didn't come to Jesus. And nothing's going to surprise God because he knows the, begin- or the end from the beginning. Like, he knows it all. You are not going to catch God off guard. Y'all know that? And all of it is a part of his eternal plan. So how do those things collide? Well, here's the thing. God, in his sovereignty, if I believe that he can take into account human free choice within his sovereignty. God's not caught off guard by any of this, and he is absolutely in control of all of this. And do I know how those two things perfectly intersect? No, because I'm not God. Ha! There, there's the answer for the day. So, which is it? Which is it? Did they stumble because they were responsible for their own actions? Yeah, they did. Did they stumble because they were destined for it? Yeah, they did. Did you know that? Because it says it right here in God's Word. So there, let's put that argument to rest. Both of those things are absolutely true. But as those who obey, as those who obey God's Word, we were chosen to be where God resides here on earth, a holy temple. He's building us into that. So we, as a whole, as the church, we are being built together. And the determining factor between who is a living stone and those who are not is the acceptance or rejection of Jesus. Henley, are you going to come up here with me? Yes! She says, preach it! Woohoo! 
that's fantastic. Man, and usually she can't stand me. And she's like running, which couldn't have been me because she's terrified of me for some reason. Where were we? Ah, okay, you are being built on the incarnate word. You are being built on Jesus. Either that or you're tripping over him. It's one or the other. That's what it says right here in God's word. So as God's chosen exiles, we are born into a new family. We are built into a new temple. And third, we are united into a new nation. We are united into a new nation. Okay, so he says, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you. And what Peter is doing here, as you get to verse 9, what he is doing here is intentionally using Old Testament language that would have referred to the nation of Israel, and he's applying it to the church. Intentionally using, I mean, just listen to it. He says a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession. That's bathed in Old Testament language for Israel bathed in it. And he says, this applies now to the church, a chosen race, holy people. And then in verse 10, he says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received more mercy. He says, essentially, before this, you were a bunch of individuals off doing your own things and to steal the language of the book of Judges. He says, you were essentially doing what was right in your own eyes. You were, you were doing your own thing. It was just you. But now you have been gathered together as a nation, as a people, as God's chosen people. And as a result of that, you become citizens of his kingdom. And this is so good. It's so good. Because he gives us the purpose of this new nation, this new race of people. Okay? Second half of verse 9, he says, So that... You're made into this new nation so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Our purpose, our purpose for being called is to proclaim God's praises. You were formed in this new nation to proclaim God's praises. He says, they stumble, but you are built up. And you are built up so that you can proclaim God's goodness to the rest of the world. You are called out of the darkness that you were in. You are brought out of that darkness and into his light. So that you can go and tell others that there is a light. Called out of darkness into the light. Um, I mean, we just, we just had prayer requests a little bit ago, so I want to be careful here. But I know a lot of bad things have come from COVID, but there is a good sermon illustration in there. Um, maybe any illness would be better. We've been, given, we've been given the antidote. We've been given the serum to a much bigger disease than COVID-19. We've been given the antidote to sin. Like, we've been given the cure for sin. And what happens is the, the doctor comes in and gives you the cure and he says, now take that cure and give it to others around you. Go and sing his praises. Proclaim his praises. And that's the job of this holy priesthood. But a lot of times, I am guilty. I won't say we because I don't know if y'all are. But I know I am. A lot of times I'm guilty of looking around and seeing people that are sick and dying and saying, well, what is wrong with you? Why in the world are you sick and dying? And instead of saying, hey, here's the cure, I condemn them because they're sick. Am I alone in that? Uh, I just, I see people who are struggling, who don't know Jesus, and that's the reason that they are sick and they are going to die separated from Christ if they aren't given the cure, which is Jesus and we have been called a royal priesthood to take that cure, this light, to bring others out of their darkness and into his light. And see, I think there's a few mistakes. Um, on the one side, there are those that we talked about last week who, who take holiness lightly, who take holiness itself lightly, and therefore there is no real distinction from the church and the world. And I think that's a huge mistake. Like, they should be fundamentally different. That's absolutely true. But then there's the flip side of that also. There are those who 
because they are different, completely isolate themselves from the rest of the world. They completely and totally separate themselves. Um, but I read this week, and I don't even know who to credit it for because I don't remember where I read it, um, but I thought this was incredibly insightful. They said separation is not isolation. It's contact without contamination. I'm going to say that again because I think that's really good. I think that's really good. Separation is not isolation. It's contact without contamination. And as I thought about that, I thought about Jesus and the lepers. Like, everybody else, the rest of the world separated away from these, from these lepers. Like you couldn't come near a leper. Didn't want to get anywhere close to them because then you would be contaminated also. But Jesus says, no, 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 it's okay. And he went out and he touched lepers. He made contact with them, but wasn't contaminated himself. Church, we should be the same way. We should do that. We should be going to those who are sick with sin. Not so that we get sin ourselves. Not so that we become like the rest of the world. We should still be fundamentally different. We should still be holy. Like we are still called to holiness. But we go and we make contact without being contaminated. So that we can take them the cure. And as citizens of this new kingdom, we are given this new job as a royal priesthood. And that's what we do. We go to the world without becoming like the world. So as God's chosen exiles, we're born into a new family, we're built into a new temple, we're united into a new nation. I didn't put this in there, but we're given a new job as this royal priesthood. So, uh, well, I had to ask myself, does Christian Fellowship Church express this kind of radical unity? Does Christian Fellowship Church exhibit this kind of unity? You know, it's, it's really easy to look at the, the church across the United States or the church across the world and say, well, no, there's really not that kind of unity. So I dialed in a little bit further and said, is there that kind of unity in this church, in this local body? And if not, if not, then why not? Because there's a couple explanations. Either it's because God doesn't care about the holiness and the unity of the church, and I certainly don't think that's the answer. Um, I don't know if you all have been paying attention the last few weeks, but clearly God cares about that. Or it's because we aren't pursuing the holiness of God as we should be. We're not pursuing the unity of the church as we've been called to. Which makes me wonder, like, are we desiring God's word? Like, are we pursuing? Are we driving after it? Are we longing for God's word? As we've been commanded to. And you can ask that on a personal level, or you can ask it on a church-wide level. I, I don't care, but first of all, first thing I think you need to do is look in the mirror, and you need to ask yourself, like, am I, am I pursuing holiness? Am I desiring God's Word? Do I have a hunger and a thirst for God's Word? Because he describes it as the pure milk. Um, and, you know, I got three kids. I remember, I remember when, they were, when they were little. And they were, they were bottle fed, so they, they'd have a bottle, and you know, they, they just never seemed to be able to get enough. You know, they'd be done with that first bottle, and then it's like, okay, well, what do we do? Well, 15 minutes later, I'm hungry again. Man, what would it be like if the church desired God's word that way? Like, really longed for God's word like that. Because I think a spiritual hunger is different from a physical hunger, and I know I've told you all this before, but if you have a physical hunger, you go and you eat, and then your hunger is satisfied, and you're good for a while. And then you just wait till that hunger comes back, and then you'll go and you'll eat again. And some of you, if you're like me, you're like, well, I'm bored, so I'm going to eat some more. Um, <clears throat> but a spiritual hunger is different. Spiritual hunger is different. You go and you take it in, you learn to metabolize that, that food that you're taking in. So you take it in, and then you let it go out. You, you put it into action. You use it. And if you're just taking in all the time and you're never going out, then you're just going to sit there and you're going to become sluggish and lazy and kind of overweight. And that's the bad thing about it. So here's what you need to do. You need to be reading God's word and then you need to be getting up and you need to be going and doing something with it. Use it. Put it into action. That's what his word says. Pursue holiness. Like put it in action. And as we do that, as the church, if we are all pursuing God's word, making his word, his eternal truth, if we are making that the center of what we are doing, then we can experience unity. That's when we can experience a unified church. The problem is we're oftentimes too busy chasing after things that we've inherited from our fathers. I'm guilty. Y'all, if you like to talk baseball, I'd love to talk baseball. If you want to talk fantasy football, that would be fun right now, too. 
But that can't be where our unity is. Our unity has to come on the basis of Jesus and his word. So um, we're going to do things just a little bit different here in a moment as we, as we wrap this up. Um, I, I, I don't even remember what song we're singing now, but I had looked it up earlier. So here, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to look again. Um, we're going to sing a song, Love Lifted Me. And I actually really like that song because it's a nice, upbeat song. So instead of offering the invitation like we normally do, I want to do something a little bit different. I mean, you're always welcome to come and pray. That's always open. That is an open invitation. While I, You know what? If I've been talking for five minutes and you want to come pray, stop me and we'll stop and pray. That's fine. I don't, I don't care. That's always an open invitation. But instead, if you need to talk to somebody, if you don't know Jesus, if you're saying, you know what, I have never submitted to Jesus as my Savior, please don't leave. I, I will be back there in the back, and I would love to talk with you. If you want to talk in private, we can go someplace to talk in private. I'll have somebody else back there at those tables, and you're welcome to talk to them. But, but today what I want to do is instead of offering some kind of formal invitation, what I want to do is I want to send us out as a unified body with a unified goal, which is to go and make disciples of all nations. That's what God's Word compels us to do. It's what it commands us to do. So here in just a moment, we're going to sing, um, and then we're going to be done. I'm going to, I'm going to say we're not going to be dismissed. We're going to be sent out. We're going to go and be this royal priesthood that God's word commands us to be. All right, so let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this word. God, I thank you that you've made unity possible. Um, Lord, and I know that it's, <laughs> it seems to be elusive in the current social and political climate that we live in. But Father, I pray that you would make your church different. Father, that you would make us holy, that we would focus on your word and on your son, and we would be unified around him and nothing else. So Father, I guess my, my prayer is, is twofold this morning. Lord, one, if there is somebody who has not been born again, Lord, I pray that, that you would call them to yourself, or that you would you would humble them, that you would call them to submit to you as the Lord that you are and the Savior that you've offered to be for them. Lord, I pray that you would draw people close to you this morning. Lord, um, because until we know the living stone that was written about here, God, we're never going to be built into this unified church. So, Father, I pray for those who don't know you that they would come to know you that they would submit to you, that they would trust in you wholeheartedly, that they, would, that they would express a faith in you and that would drive them to repent and to turn to you. Father, my, my, other, my other request this morning is for those of us who, who belong to you, who have said, I've been a part of this nation for years, some of us for decades. Um, Lord, I pray that we would, we would learn what it means to desire your word. To, to be your children and to long for the pure milk of the word, Lord. And as a result of that, I pray that we would pursue holiness and we would long for this sort of unity, that we would do whatever we can to, to urge this unity on, not by, not by sacrificing truth, God, but by relying on the ultimate truth. Um, Father, and I pray that you would be glorified through the unity of your church. So, Lord, as we, as we sing, I pray that we would begin to set our minds on your service, that we would be a royal priesthood as you've called us to be, that we would go and we would take your light to the world. And, Father, I pray, I pray that as a result of this fellowship, of Christian Fellowship Church, God, I pray that we would, we would see others come to a saving faith in Jesus. Lord, that is our, that is our desire. That is the... Uh, the cry of our hearts, God, that is what we, that's what we long for, is to see people come to know you. So, Father, be glorified in the unity of your church. And I pray this in Jesus' name.